we thought we were ready. We thought we had a few steps ahead of us, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we made a comment. (laughs) Don't tell everybody that. (laughs) We made a comment that from our research, it takes on average seven years to blend. And I think you and I looked at each other and like, we're going to do this in half the time. (laughs) You know, We're 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 extremely competitive. Yeah, we're going to do this in three years or whatever it was. We probably even said a year. Yeah. You know, I I can see us now fist bumping each other. We yeah. got this. We're going we're gonna to nail this. But uh, man, were we wrong. <laughs> Welcome to episode 281 of the Nacho Kids podcast. Man, I am so ready for fall. Fall? It's cold outside. Yeah. I think we went straight to winter. <laughs> well, you know, this time of year, it's like, well, at least where we are, it's cold in the morning. And at night, and then hot during the day. So, because yeah. we we can literally go through all four seasons in twenty four hours. <laughs> where That's we true. are, <laughs> I mean, I've seen times where it would snow and then be seventy degrees later in the day. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, David, we have been doing this podcast for over two hundred seventy five weeks. Wow. This is the most consistent thing we've ever done other than stay married. <laughs> it is. It is. And what's so funny is there's times where we haven't had one in the queue. Mm-hmm. And somebody will say, well, just replay an old one. I'm like, I can't. I can't. Yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about being consistent and having a standard like that. Yeah. You know, it's hard. Yeah. It would be a lot easier to replay some stuff, but. There's something to be said about saying we've been doing this for years and never repeated an episode. Yeah. Well, I was going to say a lot of people will do seasons. Mm -hmm. So they get a break in between. Yeah. Not us, folks. (laughs) Every week for the last five years. Yeah. Look, you don't get a break in your step family journey, and we're not going to take a break to help you out. Well, I thought it would be a good idea and we mentioned this last week, to tell people our story again. Yeah. For those who didn't go all the way back to episode one. (laughs) Right. Which it was five years ago. (laughs) Yeah. And the joke I made when you mentioned that was, I wonder if our story would change any. (laughs) Because, you know, the further you get away from something, the more little nuanced things can be a little bit different. It's It's not the story would be drastically different. But just the little nuance stuff. Well, it's like you've said before, when September 11th happened, they asked people, you know, where they were that day. And then 10 years later, Mm -hmm. and their story is completely different. Yeah. I don't even think it was 10 years later. I can't remember the exact study, but I want to think it was like maybe five or six years later or something like that. (laughs) Well, here we go. We're going to see what happens with us. Yeah. But they did. They said they asked the people you know, where were you or whatever? And they answered the question. They went back to the very same people and asked them the very same question. And like 60% of them got it wrong. And and they were like, no, that's not what you said, whatever, five, six years ago. And they were like, yeah, it is. That's what I was doing. Like, no, here's the recording. And they're like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, that's, that's interesting and yet freaking crazy at the same time. Yeah. Because it it then makes you question your own reality. <laughs> that is true. It, it really does. Like, what is it that I remember so vividly that never even happened? Right. And even crazier is when you have people that in mass remember something that never happened. Oh, oh the Mandela effect. I know. Isn't that crazy? It is. The fruit of a loom. Cornucopia thing is one of them. I don't know anything about that. Okay, so people swear that the Fruit of a Loom cornucopia thing, you know what I'm talking about? The underwear Fruit of a Loom? Yeah, I recall like the fruit being all together, but I don't recall there being a cornucopia. Well, you're the only person in America that doesn't remember that. I just remember being like gathered together. Right, but you you know what a cornucopia is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, everybody else remembers the cornucopia being there. Oh, I don't. I do. <laughs> and then the Bernstein Bears. 
What about them? Many people remember the name of the book as Berenstein Bears. B e r e n s t e i n, but it's actually Berenstein with an A. I, I honestly don't know that I ever paid attention to it enough to to know that. All right, here's another one. Monopoly, my favorite game in the world. Not, okay. All right, what about it? The Monopoly Man. Yes. He has a monocle. Are you asking or are you saying? Both. <laughs> uh, yes. No, he doesn't. Mm. Yeah, you know, I should have. I should have leaned toward my first. My first impression was no. No. Nope, I think I got him. I think I got him mixed up with. Well, no, his name is like Mister Moneybags. I think that's his name. I think you're mixing him up with the peanut guy. Yeah, you know, the peanut guy definitely has a monocle. Yep. Well, and I think on the chance cards, the Monopoly guy might have a monocle there. Not sure. Mm, yeah. But there's the it, the Stranger Things, well, is that this is how it got the Man- Mandela effect name, which was a lot of people thought that Nes- Nelson Mandela was dead. <laughs> and he wasn't. It's something to do with that, where so many people thought, like, I saw the funeral and I saw all the articles about him passing away. And it's like, no. And never happened. <laughs> yeah. But uh, interesting. It is interesting mm-hmm. how your your mind can play tricks on you and make you see and think things that may have never actually occurred. Okay, here's mm-hmm. another one. And I'm not a big Star Wars fan, so you may know this one. Many people remember Darth Vader. Uh, many people will say Darth Vader said what? Luke, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> but that's not what he said. He... he actually says, no, I am your father. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. definitely misquoted. Well, that's one of those things where if people continuously tell you something inaccurate, then you'll believe the inaccuracy. If they're going to constantly quote it wrong, then you're going to believe that. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. It's like the abundance of evidence, right? Like most people, if 90% of people you come in contact with tell you this thing, you're going to believe it just because the abundance of evidence is such. Right. Which is, which is, well, I can get in a whole nother thing, but that's, that's the whole thing with, with disinformation, misinformation, all that when they do these campaigns against people. And it's been that way for lifetimes. Yeah. So. Anyway, that said, let's talk about our story. Wait a minute. I'm not done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's see if we can get ours right. <laughs> Is Oscar Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R or M-A-Y-E-R? M-A-Y-E-R. Yeah. I know that from the song. Yeah. Yeah. M-A-Y-E-R. <laughs> but I guess it's should... M-E-Y-E-R. Yeah. Well, some people say that mayor, don't they? So it'd be Oscar Mayer. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Pikachu. Mm-hmm. Many people report remembering Pikachu as having a black tipped tail. Mm. No, I think it was his ears that were black tipped. You're correct, David. Surprisingly. Wow. I know. Yes. Why would I know that? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you ever heard of Jiffy peanut butter? Yeah. No, it's Jiff. It's Jiff. Jiff peanut butter. I was it's like, not Wait Jiffy. A Jiffy cornbread. Jiffy popcorn. Yeah. That's right. I know when mm-hmm. you said it, I was like, Jiffy peanut butter. I'm thinking no, but then I can see the J I F F or is it J I F? Anyway. J I F. You can see part of the, the label in my head and it's like, wait a minute, maybe. All right. One more. All right. Mr. Rogers. It's, it's a spelling thing, right? Nope. No. Okay. What's the song yeah. that opened every episode? Uh, will you be my neighbor? What's the first part? What's the first part? Yeah. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day in a neighborhood. Beautiful day for a neighbor. What Everybody says it's a beautiful day in a neighborhood. Okay. But it's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's a little nuanced, but okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to tell you our story again. And neither one of us have went back and listened to the story <laughs> that we told in 
five years ago, five and a half years ago. So yeah. this could be interesting. Yeah. But, well, I feel like some of the differences that we tell sometimes, because we've told this story, I mean, hundreds of times, but I, I think sometimes the differences are things like when you say, we said they're not to kids and then we laughed and it's the first time we've laughed in whatever time frame. I think sometimes we've said first time we've laughed in six months. Sometimes we've said first time we laughed in a year, you know, yeah. I think that there are some differences there again, doesn't take away from the, the story of what actually happened. But yeah, um, I, I know but that it, I do say it's the first time we've laughed in six months and that's not an exaggeration. If anything, it's between six months and a year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like we sat down and marked it on the calendar. Right. When was the last time we left? It right. just, it'd been a long, long time. Yep. Okay. David and I met. Mm -hmm. Actually, we'll tell the whole story, David. It all started. Well, part of the story. <laughs> it all started. I was at work one time, and there was this girl that had been finding dates on Plenty of Fish, right? Mm-hmm. And she came up to me and she said, Lori, I've been going out with these people and I think you'd like them. You, you should try this. <laughs> She's going to share her fish. <laughs> yeah. She's going to share her fish. <laughs> and I was like, no, I do not want to do that. I don't want to be in food line and somebody say, you that girl on plenty of fish looking for a man. <laughs> so I did not want to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, Jackson was going to his dad's. For like summer, you know, a week here, a week there kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I noticed they were taking pictures of me. And I'm like, oh, no, no. They were going to create me a profile. So I finally gave in and I said, okay, fine. One week. I'll do it one week. Needless to say, in that week, I connected with David. <laughs> At the time, well, he still does. David has four sons. I have one son. When we met... The triplets had just turned eight. It was their eighth birthday, actually, the day we met. Not the mm -hmm. day we talked, but the day we met. Because we talked a little bit before we met. Mm -hmm. And so Jackson was three. Avery was nine, about to turn 10. No. Yes. Avery mm -hmm. was nine, about to turn 10. And that's what the story changes. Because I always think Avery was 10 when we got married, but he was 11 when we got married. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, since David and I, neither one were looking for a relationship, I didn't really care if, how many kids he had. Long story short, David fell in love with me. He, just, <laughs> he couldn't resist himself. I he thought just, you were going to tell the true story. <laughs> <laughs> he did fall in love with me. You left out a whole bunch of juicy stuff in the middle. <laughs> well, they don't need to know all that. So, anyway, long story short, David and I decided to get married. Because he loved me so much. <laughs> and, <laughs> and and we knew that this blended family stuff would not be easy. So we did a lot of research. I you read did a lot of research. Well, you did too. You talked to people more, like people that you would run into or knew. Mm -hmm. And I read more books and told you what they said. Yeah. So we even met with a counselor that I knew. Mm -hmm. We thought we were ready. We thought we had a few steps ahead of us, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we made a comment. <laughs> Don't tell everybody that. <laughs> we made a comment that from our research, it takes on average seven years to blend. And I think you and I looked at each other and like, we're going to do this in half the time. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're extremely gonna, competitive. Yeah, we're going to do this in three years or whatever it was. We probably even said a year. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I can see us now. Fist bumping each other. We yeah. got this. We're going we're gonna to nail this. But, um, man, were we wrong? <laughs> well, let me say, the kids were excited about us getting married. It didn't take long for that to change. We often talk about the terrible twos of the blend because your two to three seems to be the hardest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's when it happened to us. Mm-hmm. I am not trying to make things sound worse than they were because I don't think I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were horrible. David had even mentioned 
maybe Jackson and I go live somewhere else until we can figure out how to do this because this wasn't working. And my response was, if I leave, I'm not coming back. And yeah. I knew that 100%. Yeah. I mean, just to just to talk a, a bit about how bad it was, you and I were not really communicating very much. We were sleeping in separate rooms. Really just, I don't know how you felt about it. For me, I was kind of waiting for the other shooter drop. Like I was waiting on divorce papers. Like I didn't want to be the one to pull the trigger, but I was completely okay if you did. That's how bad it was. Makes me sad. <laughs> it was sad. It was very sad. Very sad. <laughs> okay. I'm about to cry. <laughs> Don't cry. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> and you, you had gone through so much stress that you had lost so much weight because of the stress that you were having some major health issues. Yeah. And the doctors thought I had pancreatic cancer. That was scary. Mm -hmm. So good news. You don't have cancer. Bad news is you're in a blended family. <laughs> yeah. And I had a lot of stress at work because I physically was sick. Like, mm -hmm. y'all, I can't tell you, it took all of my energy to take a shower. Yeah. Like, I would have to take a break. I lost, like, 35, 40 pounds in a month and a half. Yeah, it was it was bad. I and weighed less than I remember weighing in the sixth grade, if that tells you anything. <laughs> yeah. And during that time, too, and I don't know exactly when it started, because sometimes we get asked that, like, when did it start getting bad? I don't, I don't recognize necessarily like a start date. I think it was like just slowly progressing and progressing and progressing until mm -hmm. it got to the point where it was just that bad. And, uh, you know, I recall so much damage that happened over that period of time. We'll just say year two to three, something like that, that, you you and I were not getting along. We were under so much stress. The kids didn't like being here. You didn't like being here. Heck, I didn't like being here. Our conversations, when we would have them, were very hurtful. We would say things to each other, yelling and screaming at each other sometimes. I mean, it just it was just so bad. I remember being at the doctor. And having one of those tests done that I had to stay there like five hours. And I remember thinking on the way there that I was all by myself. And I think I ended up texting you something and you didn't reply. Like the whole time. And I remember laying there and I'm like, I'm done. I'm not going to go through... I mean, I understand that we're going through stuff, but like, I thought I was dying and you didn't even care to respond to a text message. Mm -hmm. So instead, I laid there and looked at apartments. And I think that was a reality check for me, but there was still something for whatever reason. I guess I loved you. <laughs> I guess that, I loved um, you. <laughs> well, you know. I know I loved you, but at that point, I don't think anybody loved anybody. It, it was it was beyond that. It, as Tina Turner would say, what does love have to do with it at that point? Like, really? Like, I, and this is, I think, why we were talking about, or I, I mentioned the whole living apart. What is it? Living together apart or whatever that some people do. Mm -hmm. Living like, apart together. Yeah. Because we were fantastic in the beginning. And... Part of the reason we got married was because we enjoyed spending time with each, with each other. We enjoyed the friendship. Like, we like hanging out with each other. And that's, that to me was one of the big draws. Like, I just enjoy hanging out with her. It's just fun. And she's, you know, I can see her being a great friend. And so that's where it all kind of got started. But, um, yeah, things were, things were bad. And I guess if you want to fast forward a little bit, we had, well, um, wait a minute before you fast forward. I remember asking you, and honestly, it was probably that day that I came back from the doctors because of the fact that I had reached out and you just ignored me. And I remember asking you if you wished I would die. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that. And I meant it. The only thing that kept me here was Jackson. Yep. I didn't know this was going to be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's hard to talk about. Even, what, 13 years later? Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to talk about. But this is what we do to help folks. So anyway, go ahead, David. Mm -hmm. I'll just sit here and cry. You go right in. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You're a sensitive man. I'm not, I'm not not insensitive. I'm able to, I'm able to recognize that was a different time and a different person in a different relationship. Yeah, but it's still like PTSD. It it is. I mean, even just talking about it, I'm feeling it. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. So I guess fast forward a little bit, you and I decided that we needed counseling. And I think you brought it up. And so we went to our, we went to our church first and we, we couldn't even ride together. We had to drive two separate vehicles to our church, which was 35 minutes away. So we, we go there and we're sitting in a room and it's, it's like an intervention. It was kind of, it's kind of laughable thinking back on it because they had you on one side of the room with like three people had me on the other side of the room with like three people. It's, I, you know, it, it was almost like they felt <laughs> like we were going to like literally go at each other physically or something. They had yeah. so many people in the room. <laughs> and um, I don't recall a whole lot about that conversation, except I remember I remember being emotional, but I also remember one of the guys there, his name was Pastor Paul, and he said, he was asking both of us individually, like, do you want this to work? And he asked me, he asked me, do you want it to work? And I said, yes, but not like this. Like, I don't want it to work like this. It is not working the way it's going. It Something's got to change. It's got to change fast because we can't survive much longer like this. And I meant that literally something I felt something bad's going to happen. Not like I was going to hurt you or you're going to hurt me or nothing like that, but just your health was bad. I think both of our mental health was bad. Something had to change. We were, we were dying. So. And I remember sitting on the side of the bed one day trying to, after I'd put my shoes on or something, and I'm telling y'all, that took like an act of Congress. It took too much effort for me to do that stuff. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm dying. I am dying. And honestly, I wasn't afraid of dying because, I mean, look what we were going through. Yeah, it's probably a better option. Right. I mean, it wasn't, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. It's like physically. My body was going through stuff that could have killed me. Mm -hmm. Mentally, I was going through stuff that could have killed me. So it was like both. But I remember sitting on the edge of the bed and thinking, I'm going to die. Like, I'm really dying. And it wasn't necessarily because they thought I had cancer. But, y'all, I'm telling you, I look like I was a drug addict living on the streets. Mm-hmm. I had lost so much weight. I would see David's friends and I go, Hey, how you doing? And they'd look at me like, Who are you? Mm-hmm. I was wearing a size 12 in kids' clothes. But anyway, I remember, I remember having that feeling and I've never felt that before in my life. And that was scary. And then Jesus loved me popped in my head. And I thought about Jackson. And I was like, you know, regardless of what's going on with work, regardless of what's going on with David and this blended family crap, my son needs me. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it was, like you said, something's got to give. Right. If for me, in order for me to be a good mom, if that means that we had to split up, that's what was going to happen. Yeah. So the, the church, you know, the church offered to, pay for us to go somewhere. I mean, they did a fantastic job, you know, and, and you and I, we believe that the church is there to help its 
members and even outside of its membership. But we also, we were not in a position where we needed the financial help. Right. So Lori had this counselor that she had already been to previously because of a previous, you know, baby daddy stuff and court stuff and all that. So she's like, do you mind if we go see Dr. Butler? And I'm like, I don't care. We'd already met him. You'd already met him. Well, that's right. We did. We did meet him, but it was, um, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a preference. Right. And you know, I was like, well, I mean, you're already comfortable with him. He already kind of knows your history. I think it would be better to start there. Well, and, and I felt uh, like he knew me. Like mm-hmm. he, he knew my heart. He knew me as a person. Mm-hmm. Because like you said, I had to be, go to him because of court ordered counseling with baby daddy to try to build a co-parenting relationship. Needless to say, that was useless. But, and so I called him and I said, Dr. Butler, it's Lori. And I said, how you doing? I never tell him by my last name when I call him. It's just a guessing game. And um, it, is, said, it is your name. It's like yeah. you were one of the, you were a first name person. Yeah, I'm a first name person. <laughs> like Prince. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'm Lori. And um, so I said, hey, it's Lori. And he's like, I've been waiting for you to call. That's he what wasn't, you want to hear. Yeah, he wasn't shocked. He wasn't surprised. And I said, things are really bad. Mm-hmm. Can we come talk to you? And he said, of course. So David and I met with Dr. Butler. And he said, Lori, they are not your kids. And I'm like, duh. I know how many kids I've had. But it kind of hurt my feelings because I did care about them. I wanted them to, I wanted the best for them. And so I made that comment to Dr. Butler. I said, but I want them to have good hygiene. He said, Lori, they're not your kids. I said, but I want them to have good grades in school. They're not your kids. And that's all he said to me, literally. Yeah, for like 45 minutes straight. <laughs> yeah. And so I looked at him and I said, did you fall off your bike? Because that's all you keep saying to me. And he's like, they're not your kids. Everything I th- could think of, he's like, they're not your kids. They're not your kids. Mm-hmm. Which good thing he knew how hard-headed I was. Mm-hmm. And so David and I were leaving and I looked at David, we were in the parking lot, and I said, all he kept saying to me were, they are nacho kids. And I wasn't trying to say nacho kids, but with my Southern accent, that's what came out. Mm-hmm. And we started laughing. And that was the first time in six months or a year. <laughs> <laughs> in a long time. In a long time that we both laughed. Yeah. And y'all, that is when it hit me. I say the clouds parted, the rays came down from heaven. And I'm like, they're not my kids. They're not my kids. What the world? Yeah. What in the world? <laughs> and it's not that David didn't care if they had good hygiene or if they had bad grades. It's just the dynamics of, quote, quote, a family. Yeah. Usually the woman takes over certain things, you know, making sure the kids are taken care of, all that stuff. So that's kind of what happened. But anyway, that's when it hit me. And it was like the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. From that point forward, we created what is now known globally as Nacho Kids. Universally. I heard people on Mars talking about it. David. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's back up a minute, if you, if you will. And let's talk about what we believe went wrong. How did we do all this research and thought we were so prepared? What are some of the things that you see as now that you can look back and go, oh, this is where we messed up? Well, all of the research I read, treat them like your own, love them like your own. You are the mom in the home. Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. No, that did not work for us. And through us doing this, we've realized it doesn't work for a lot of people. Yep. You have the societal pressures to be the mom, Mm -hmm. but the kids don't need a mom. They have a mom. It doesn't matter if the mom's dead, incarcerated, whatever. They still have a mom. Mm -hmm. It's not like I ever thought I was their mom, but it was that motherly tendencies of telling them what to do, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and and the worse our relationship was because it wasn't it wasn't the 
we only have problems behind closed doors and the kids don't know about it. It was very well known <laughs> to everybody that we were having issues. Right. And it's not like we intentionally fought in front of the kids, but it was just obvious. Yeah. No, the we tension didn't. was so great. Yeah. And from from my perspective, some of the problems that we created was basically the misalignment of expectations. Like, for example, you know, I would tell you, I expect you to punish them and I expect you to tell them what to do. And I expect you to, you know, help them brush their teeth or help them meaning tell them, you know, if you see it needs to be done then tell them to do it. So I, I expected you to do all these things, which we now know. But here's the thing, we no-no. never discussed it. No, we didn't ever discuss it. But I had that. It's like if you were to call me at work, because at the time I was working a job where I had to be at work at like four o'clock in the morning. So you always got stuck with having to take them to school. And the whole morning routine got you got stuck with. Right. And if, if you were to call me and be like, you know, Avery's not getting in the car and I'm going to be late for work, my response would be like, well, drag his butt to the car. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah. throw him in it or whatever. Or leave him. I remember one time me saying, just leave him. Just leave him at home. Yeah. Just go. I remember that too. Yeah. I, well, I mean, it's not like he was five. So leave him at home. He'll be fine. And we live two doors down from my parents. So he'll be okay. Right. But leave I couldn't him. do it. I couldn't do it. Nope. And so you mentioned we live close to your parents. Mm-hmm. That was another problem. Yeah, it, it absolutely was another problem. Um, I don't know that we want to go into that whole thing right now. Well, we'll just say it this way. I think you can sum it all up in family members, you know, love the kids, the grandkids, the nephews, all this stuff. And so when kids are complaining, they're complaining to everybody. They're complaining to grandparents. They're complaining to aunts and uncles. They're complaining to their mom. And so all these people come to the rescue of the kids. And who's the villain in the story? Lori. Yep. Stepmom. Mm-hmm. So, needless to say, there was a couple of different things that happened. One is, most of the time, it was them telling the kids and reaffirming their versions of the story and how they felt. And, yes, Lori's terrible. Yes, she shouldn't have told you to do that. Yes, she's the evil stepmom. Just all this kind of stuff. And then the other side of it was they would come to me. And... I heard Lori did this and you need to take care of this and you need to do that. And you need, you need to get sell her down and what blah, 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 everything. And so at, at the same time, you would often come to me with your kids fill in the blank, your mom fill in the blank, your whatever, fill in the blank, your ex, whatever it is. And so I feel like I'm in the middle, like, okay, the kids are coming to me fussing. My family's coming to me fussing. My wife's coming to me fussing. My ex is coming to me fussing. It's like, what in the world? What am I supposed to do here? Because no matter what choice I make, I'm choosing who I'm going to piss off. Well, I do want to say there was a time that you were supporting your mother's bashing of me. There was a text message back and forth between you and your mom. And... You said something about, I don't know, Lori's in a mood today. And (laughs) she said, she's always in a mood. And you said, you're right. And so it was just bashing Lori. Let's Mm -hmm. bash Lori. So I now have a shirt that says, I'm in one of my moods. (laughs) I'm always in in a mood or something like that. I'm in one of my moods. That's what it says. I'm in one of my moods. Yep. And I wear it occasionally. Yeah. Around your mom. (laughs) Yep. Yep. But anyway. I wanted to say that because that didn't help things. No, it didn't. Nope, it didn't. And there was a lot of confrontation that had to happen. Like I had to confront you about stuff. I had to confront the kids about stuff. I even confronted my family about stuff and it was not comfortable. None of these things were comfortable because a lot of people got pissed off. Yep. So we come back from Dr. Butler. Mm -hmm. I feel like the weight of the world is lifted off my shoulders. And I swear when you walked in the house, you could feel a difference. And over the next year, 
Well, I think you had permission. That was what you're you were looking for. Not even knowing what you're looking for. You're looking for permi- permission to step away from all of the responsibilities and things that were causing us so much stress. I think if I couldn't have support, I needed that permission. Yep. And I was honestly happy about it because I, I think I realized that part of the problem was that you were too involved, but I don't, I don't know that I understood any way to say that without it coming out as, you know, you're overbearing, you're overstepping, you're whatever. It it just, you know what I'm saying? Well, I'm surprised you held back. <laughs> I mean, nothing else I mean, I held you back. No, but I, I mean, again, I don't know that it's like I, there was nothing, there was nothing there for me to try to figure out how to navigate. I think I was just mostly at the end of my rope. Like nothing's working. I don't know of anything else to do. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you, you're drowning and you're, you're exhausted and you're like, this is it. Like, I can't do any more. I'm just going to slowly sink. Yeah. Well, we did kind of skip this because we kind of jumped ahead a little bit. But at one point, Mr. Butler asked the kids, what could Lori do to make this better? Yeah, that was in a, a different session we'd went because yeah. we went for several times. It wasn't the <laughs> first session that we went. Yeah. Now, you got to remember these kids, in their head, they were abused. They were telling their daddy they were abused. They were telling their aunt, their uncle, their mama, their grandpa, grandparents, whatever. Their response was, take us to Disney. Yeah. And I was like, eh, there. There it is. I was. I was. I'm not abusing these freaking kids. I was mad about that. Not because I wanted them to come up and say something, you know, terrible. Which, I mean, there, there was nothing terrible. I knew you weren't abusing the kids, but I, I was looking for uh, some type of response. Like, you know, quit telling us what to do. Quit, yeah. Quit telling us what to do and stop doing whatever or whatever. And it was nothing that it was like, take us to Disney. And fortunately this was like one of these big intervention meetings we had with the counselor because he, even my parents were there. And, and so the counselor comes out and the counselor tells, you know, this is what I asked them and this is what they said. And I'm glad it came from him and not me and you. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, I'm not trying to play victim here. I'm just trying to convey how much this destroyed me mentally. Mm-hmm. There is no doubt in my mind that everybody would have been better off if I would have died. Not true. 100%. 100%. But that's how bad things were. Yeah. So, needless to say, we had to do a, an abundant amount of healing and repair work for our relationship. Not just relationship with, between me and Lori, but, you know, the kids, the extended family. I mean, this is, it took a massive amount of work from that point forward. And mm-hmm. it wasn't something that we fixed it overnight. It wasn't something we fixed in a year. It right. took it took a long, long time. Now we got to the point where we were okay within about a year or so. I, I think that we started the healing process immediately. Oh, we did, right? But over that year, you know, people use the word disengage. You can call it dis- disengage, disconnect, step aside, step back, whatever you want to call it. But that's what I did, mm-hmm. and I had to do it for a year because. There was so much that I had to heal from. Your kids had to heal from. Everybody had to heal from. Yeah. And everybody needed to feel that things were were different. Right. Not just temporarily. Yeah. And that was the big key that we found. Like when, when during that point of stepping back, things felt different. Now... Here's the kicker, and this is where a lot of step families mess up, is they do that this disengagement part or the stepping back part, and that's all they do. And they're like, oh, things are better. I'm like, no, things aren't better. Yeah, because they stop, and then things go back to where they were. Right. 
like you still got a lot of other things you've got to fix and you've got to address and you've got to learn and you got to grow and you got to have more tools in your tool belt to handle these things. It's, you know, it's, you can't say, well, because I'm not here, things are great. So let me go back and things will still be great. It just doesn't happen that way. Right. And we even experienced that to some degree when you would see yourself as being kind of left out of things and you're like, Hey, I just, I want to, I'm going to step back in. I'm going to see how things are going. And you'd go, Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah. Not ready for that. And so you'd step, you step back again. And the re-engagement with the kids was different with every one of them. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because some of them, there was more hurt. Mm Mm-hmm. Me, Branson and Ethan, the Yoohoo incident. Yep. Yoohoo gate. Which is funny because you have a better relationship with those two now than you do the ones that didn't give you a hard time. Yeah. Interesting. It is interesting. So during that year, that's not all I did, y'all. It's not like I just stepped back, right? I did focus on Jackson more. I focused on David and my relationship with David. But I also used that year to... Learn to let go of things I can't control. Let David be the parent. They needed him to be the parent, and he needed to be the parent. Yeah, and that was probably one of the harder pieces because you look at what somebody's doing, and it's not the way you would do it. And if you're not careful, you're saying to yourself, you're not doing it right. Mm -hmm. And that's not not accurate. Right. Most of the time, it's not accurate. It's, It's not that they're not doing it right. They're just not doing it the way you think they should do it. Right. So, again, throughout that year, there was a lot of self-development. There was a lot of coming up with realistic expectations, sharing those expectations, changing my perspective, because during the hardest times, I didn't see what the kids were going through. I only saw what I was going through. So I had to change my perspective on those things. And there was a lot of work. I had to Learn to respond instead of react. Give things the proper emotional weight. Again, convey the expectations and realistic expectations. And the joke is I had none. Mm -hmm. Which really, I didn't. Because expectations lead to disappointment and resentment. So it was best that I had none. But anyway, over that year, I worked on myself focused on my son, focused on my relationship with David. Then we were able for me to re-engage with the stepkids. And I'll never forget the one time you sent me a text and said, Ethan can't wait to tell you something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Now, these are kids, y'all, that would come to the house or come home. I call it home. And I'd say, hey, glad you're here. You know, we miss you or something like that. And they would ignore me. And it would piss me off, right? Mm -hmm. So I decided through part of my not joining process was I'm not engaging in any type of negative interaction. And that means even on my point. So if I said something to them, they didn't respond. It made me mad. Then I in turn would be like, they're rude kids, David. You need to do something, blah, blah, blah. So I stopped talking to them when they came in. Y'all, I'm not kidding. You would not believe how quickly one of these children started coming in and talking to me Mm -hmm. because I wasn't forcing that relationship. Right. Yeah. You were giving them the autonomy to make the choice of where the relationship went and how fast it went. Right. And so a lot of times when the stepkids don't respond the way you think they should, it's, oh, they're disrespectful. They're this, they're that, or whatever. Well, I don't know. Now, in hindsight, I can see these things, but how do I know that bio mom didn't say something to them before they got here about me. And that's why they're acting weird when they come in. Mm -hmm. Did they have a bad day at school? It's not always about me. That was something else that I had to learn through this journey. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I started a secret Facebook group when I started seeing this nacho stuff working for us, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So I would find other stepmoms and stepmom groups. And if they said, like, I don't love my stepkids like my own, and they would be attacked by other stepmoms, 
I would reach out to them and say, hey, I saw that you were struggling. I saw you were being attacked. I've got this secret group, and I'd love to share with you what I did that helped us. Long story short, it worked for them. Mm -hmm. And we started the podcast in the Nacho Kids Academy. And we started the Nacho Kids Academy because we realized quickly that Facebook was not the platform to teach the method. There's Mm -hmm. too much noise. Yep. There's too much noise, not enough nacho education. Yeah. Well, there, well there's also one of you. So right. it's, you know, how, how can we scale it to where you can reach more people with the right message? Right. And I want to reiterate, too, because it just popped in my head, the goal of nachoing is to lower the stress in the blend. Mm-hmm. The ultimate goal is to better all the blended relationships. Right. Because you can get rid of the stress and not heal those relationships. Mm -hmm. But there are some situations that the stepmom or the stepkid doesn't want a relationship. And that's okay. You can still be cordial and not cause tension in the home. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of our story in a nutshell. And it's, I mean, we're covering what, three to five years? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, probably three to five years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, in, in an hour ish, we covered, you know, three to five years of our life. So there's a, obviously there's a lot of details and, and all that, but we hope that we've. Yeah. Like how given, I started doing this full time. Crazy. <laughs> but we wanted to give you our story as best we could from the beginning, how things started out great, went to less than. <laughs> Less than terrible, worse than than terrible. (laughs) It was absolutely horrific, honestly. And then, you know, here we are. We just celebrated our 15-year wedding anniversary recently. Yep. And I feel like our relationship continues to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. And I'm going to tell y'all that since I got so emotional this morning, one thing I've learned through this nacho journey, and it's something that we do teach in the academy, because again, it's not just disengaging, is it's okay that I felt those emotions this morning, but I don't need to carry them all day. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to do something when we finish with this for me to regroup. Because if not, I will carry it with me all day. And then I won't even think about our anniversary that we just had. I'll be thinking Mm -hmm. about all the things that hurt me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether it was things you said, things you did, whatever. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's plenty and there's plenty there you could draw from if that's what yep. you want to focus on. But I'm not. Nope. But there's also plenty of positive to draw from. Right. And you know, that's that's one of the things too. Like when you have negative interactions, like there's not a it's not a one to one ratio. It's not like, well, I did this good thing over here, that makes up for the bad things. Like, no, you gotta do <laughs> ten good things. <laughs> yeah. And then was- and then maybe you've, you know counteracted that one bad thing. I remember Dr. Butler telling me five positives to one negative. Mm -hmm. You can say one negative thing for every five positive things you say to the stepkids. I said, I'll never talk to them again. (laughs) Because y'all, that's how bad it was. I could not find something positive about kids. Kids. Yeah. I couldn't even see it. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, when you're hurting like that, there is nothing else that matters. It's kind of like when you can't breathe, you don't care about anything else but breathing. Right. And when you're hurting, you don't look at other people's hurt. Yep. Mm-hmm. So anyway, folks, just know no matter how bad things are, and please don't hear what I'm not saying. We're not saying stay in an abusive relationship. But no matter how bad things are, there's always hope. But it takes a lot of work. Yeah. And I want you to know, if you do decide to join the Nacho Kids Academy to get help, or you decide to do the coaching with David and I to get help, or take one of our challenges, whatever, I want you to know that I'm just as invested in your relationship as you are. Yeah, sometimes more so. Sometimes more so, (laughs) which can cause a problem. (laughs) We want y'all to be successful. We want you to wake up 
and be glad you have this family. We don't want you to wake up and hate your life. I was there. It sucks. Mm -hmm. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt where we came from, that that is our purpose in helping others. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's why we were placed on this planet. I believe that. Yeah. So anyway, that's it. Uh, I know there was probably a lot of uh, uh, heavy stuff during this episode, but we wanted to go back through our story. And I think maybe we told it better than we did in, in the first episode. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to put it in chat GPT and say, compare these stories and find the differences, yeah, which I'm sure chat. we left a lot out. There's no way that we can tell you the whole story in no. an hour. No. And um, there's no way we can tell you everything you need to know about Nacho in an hour. But we do want to reiterate that you are not alone in this. Mm-hmm. And even if you're not struggling like we were, but you're just not happy, don't give up on your blend. Put some work into it. Yeah. Yeah, because if you've got kids and you leave this relationship and start another one, guess what? Another blend. You got another blend that you're probably going to deal with a lot of the similar things, if not the exact same things. Yep. It's, it's not going to go away. Like you've got to understand how to navigate blended families if right. you're going to be in a blended family. Well, and we often say not showing does not keep you from having challenges. It prepares you to how to deal with them. Oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 Our job is not to have you avoid challenges, although you can. Yes. Yeah, sometimes you can. Yes. Yeah, our job is to hopefully, well, I guess it's twofold. One is to give you the warning signs, so hopefully you don't go down that path. But two, sometimes some paths you have to go down, and we just give you the tools you need to to do it a heck of a lot better than we did. Right. <laughs> All, All right. right. That's our show for today, folks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to share this out. There's got to be somebody that you probably know that could use this. So send it to them, have them listen to it. If you feel bad, you're down, things aren't going well, you need to go back to this episode to listen to it, then bookmark it. Mm-hmm. But uh, one thing we do ask is that you go leave us a review. That's all we ask. Yeah, that'll help other step families find us. Yeah, because the more reviews we have, the more it pushes us up to the top of searches and all this kind of stuff. And you would be doing your part in helping other blended families by doing that. And we thank you for it. Yep. So join us again next week. And remember... Life is good when you nacho. Know,